behind the metaphor, we discover its delightful Greek origins. Kairos, meaning opportunity, was the youngest son of the god Zeus, who was depicted as a beautiful youth with a lock of hair dangling over his forehead. The Greek term has a lovely origins, as, as the being that the Kairos was actually the son of Zeus, who had a forelock hanging in front of his face, and then just stubble at the back. And so the idea was you had to go, grab Kairos opportunity as it raced by, because if you didn't, you would just get a handful of stubble. So trying to point out, I think that this is a moment of great opportunity for people thinking about progressive um, thought. Uh, we have so many opportunities in that we have a postmodern world where people are um, questioning all ideas of absolute truth. We have um, churches losing their authoritative grasp on people with all sorts of things going on. And we have a lot of religious papers and books in the marketplace for, well, previously they weren't there. The authority usually came from the clergy or the church. So it's a marvellous moment for people to do their own theology and I think that's what we should be trying to do. Theologian Sally McFay calls theology that most pretentious, abstract and obscure enterprise is simply the attempt by people, human beings, to speak of God from their own experience in the light of their own faith. Today we have to all do our own theology, creating something that is functional and not obtuse, and that actually works in our individual lives. I don't think doing our own theology is a recipe for anarchy because theology is basically thinking about God or talking about God and we do it all the time regardless of how much we think we are locked into a particular tradition we are still asking how that tradition how that teaching shapes our lives so the question now I think is that we, we when we start to realize that a lot of this theology, a lot of the traditional um, ideas have been formed in a time long before our time and under worldviews and knowledge that we now have moved far beyond, that we need to be doing our own thinking. It's, I guess, contextual theology is another good way of talking about it. Rather than starting from doctrines that have been dropped from heaven, um, we need to start by thinking, what is my situation? What is good news for me today? And that's how feminist theology got going, you know, what the church was saying was not good news for women. How liberation theology starts, it wasn't good news for the poor. So asking what is good news in our time and place, and then from there, thinking about God. Perhaps the most stunning example today of grasping Kairos' forelock is our reinvention of the sacred. As I outlined in my last book, Like Catching Water in a Net, most serious scholars have abandoned the old man God in the skies, judging who's naughty and nice, and intervening in a world to break the natural laws to reward some and not others. In progressive thinking, this God has long been substituted for the sacred within the universe. Well, we've had a period in Christianity where the sacred was basically banished to the heavens. And we look at our church art right to the medieval period, we find this, these images of God and Christ and, and the, the Holy Spirit up on the cloud. And that was not really the only image that the Bible talks about. We have these wonderful biblical images of the, of the um, where shall I go from your spirit? I go to heaven if I go to Sheol, you know, in terms of God being everywhere. And even in John's Gospel, you know, that, that the spirit of truth will be with you and in you. We have all these imagery of this imagery of the sacred in everything and with everything from our own biblical tradition, and so I think it's it's reclaiming the fact that the that um, the sacred disappeared to the heavens, and we had church and pope and ecclesial authority that would then negotiate that for us, rather than the spirit within everything. If we speak of the sacred in everything or as that in which we live and move and have our being, we are speaking of that which is in everything and everyone. Hindu, Christian, atheist, Sikh. Well, once we start talking about the sacred as being in everything, in the world, in the universe, or, or trying to describe the sacred as part of, of who we are, or the earth as um, 
God in whom we live and move and have our being, once we get into that sort of imagery, we can no longer talk about um, God as being belonging to Christianity or just to one religious tradition. If God is in everything, then God is in Hindus, Sikhs, all these people who have sought wisdom and transformation in their time and place. And so we, we can't just talk about a new way of seeing the sacred as being in everything unless we also realize that this means the sacred is, is found and described within religions other than our own. And that should therefore make us interested in what these other religions have said and how human beings, not, not going only with the doctrines and the traditions, but how have human beings in other times and places and around us now today in other religions, how are they experiencing or not what they see as the sacred.